Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson, I am your host, and I am a technical consultant for Altium. And today we're gonna continue looking at back drilling and via stubs, and we're actually gonna determine what data rates you can support with a given stub length. Now, in a previous video, we calculated the frequencies that produce strong loss in an interconnect based on the length of a via stub. Once you know those frequencies, you can actually figure out what the bandwidth of your channel is, and then you can use that to figure out what data rate you can support. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna look at those data rates. Let's go ahead and get started. Well, lead back to your question. Before we actually calculate what the data rate that you can support is and what frequencies you can support, we need to look at this guy, DK effective. So to do that, I've actually prepared a couple of slides and we're gonna look at that now. Okay, so what we're looking at in this slide is everything that you basically need to know in order to calculate what the stub length is uh, for a given frequency or uh, the uh, smallest resonant uh, frequency for a given stub length. So here we've got our wavelengths. This is related to the stub length. Uh, L is the stub length. And then we plug that in here in F sub N, and that gives us the uh, lowest frequency, or that gives us the frequency uh, for a given stub length and wavelength. So uh, just remember, you know, you're calculating any number of possible resonances. You wanna make sure that all your signal is confined uh, below the n equals 1 frequency or between the n equals 1 and n equals 3 frequency, so on and so forth. So um, here, since you know we're talking about digital signals and high-speed digital stuff is carried over differential pairs, um, we need to look at what the effective dielectric constant is, or dK effective, uh, as a function of these geometric parameters. So uh, in this uh, image here on the left, um, d is your hole diameter. And so here you have a pair of vias carrying a differential signal, hole diameter D. Now W here, um, I had originally thought that this was always the pad diameter, but this is actually the anti-pad diameter. Um, now your anti-pad should be at least as big as your pad just to accommodate dr uh, drill wander, um, but it can be larger. And in fact, your, uh, your anti-pad diameter doesn't have to be for a circle. You could actually have like an oval diameter um, or an, an oval uh, shaped anti-pad, I should say. And so if you do that, um, H and W would be different. So um, here in this blog link down at the bottom of the screen, um, you'll see an example of that uh, in uh, Bert Simonovich's uh, original blog on this topic. So I, I highly recommend anybody who's interested in this, go ahead and read that. So uh, here the spacing is the hole to hole spacing, and that pretty much covers everything you need to know about these geometric parameters. Now, when you plug all of this into the DK effective equation, there's two other pieces of information you need to know, uh, the transverse dielectric constant or uh, the dielectric constant in the same direction and perpendicular to the trace, so basically like in the plane, and then the z-axis uh, dielectric constant. And these are not always the same value. In fact, they can differ by uh, anywhere from like 15 to 20%. And so the, -ax or the z-axis uh, dielectric constant goes along the direction of the via barrel. So then when you plug everything in here, as well as all the geometry or the geometric parameters, um, you'll get a DK effective value. Now for some laminates, uh, particularly a thin laminate, it is possible that these two are gonna be very close and you should check the data sheet. Not all data sheets are going to distinguish between these two. Um, I've seen, as I recall, a Rogers data sheet where they did distinguish between the z-axis and then the transverse direction, dielectric constants. They don't always do that. So just be careful of that, especially when you're selecting materials. And then you're going to try and calculate your DK effective value for the uh, uh, for this material and for this via arrangement. Now, at the end of the day, what you ultimately want to get to is an equation like this, where you're relating the maximum sub length for or, or required to, I should say, uh, stay below uh, the n equals one resonance. Uh, to the data rate that you want to have in, uh, in your system. So, um, here, this L max is in inches. 
uh, baud is uh, your data rate or your baud rate, and then DK effective obviously is, is right here. And um, this is not an exact uh, equation here, it's just an approximation, um, but it's uh, it's a better equation than you know just 0 0.3 divided by gigabaud or something like this. Um, this equation is, or this approximation I should say, is um, a little less conservative, um, but still uh, still relatively valid, or at least a good place to start with sizing your via stubs. And this is the equation that uh, Bert has in uh, this blog link down here. So again, I would encourage anyone who's interested in this, go read this blog link and check it out and learn as much as you can. Okay, so let's get back to the situation at hand here. Now we're dealing with the situation where we wanted to determine the values of the frequencies for this stub length given length L. So we have a DK value that we pull off from the data sheet for the substrate. There is going to be a DK transverse, which is basically along the surface of the PCB. And then there's also a DK Z value, which is the DK value seen traveling vertically through the substrate. We can just approximate these as being about equal to the DK value for our data sheet. So they're not always the same, but for a thin laminate, you can regard them as being very close. And for this example that we're going to do right now, we're just gonna take DK to be basically equal to four. If we consider a situation where we have, let's say, a pair of vias, we have 10 mil drill holes, we have 20 mil pads, and then we have 10 mil pad to pad separation, what you will actually find is that DK effective is basically 7.6. So you have a factor 1.9 increase in the DK value. So this is the DK effective value. So you can use this and then use your L value here to figure out what is the frequency. So let's just suppose for a moment that we go with the 25 mil uh, value here for L and we wanna figure out what those frequencies are. So if we have L equals 25 mils, what you'll find is that the lowest order frequency is basically about 42 gigahertz. So that's pretty good. That'll support low frequency radar. Um, it'll support a lot of high speed signals. You could conceivably route into an internal layer, maybe on a six layer board, and just leave all the rest of this, and that's gonna support a lot of different signals. So if we go all the way to the limit, let's say it's a 10 mil limit, F sub one E is going to be about 109 gigahertz. So I bring up this 10 mils here because again, fabricators can only go so far. 10 mils is the, mo the limit that most of them will specify. However, it's appropriate to try and push them. If they can do less, then that's great. If not, make sure you know how far they can go if you figure out that you do need to actually back drill because you are working with such high speed signals. Now, let's just suppose that you were working with a 25 mil stub and we wanna know what is the data rate that this could support. Well, you could look at this in terms of either the Nyquist or you could look at this in terms of the baud rate. Baud rate is just essentially half of whatever this data rate is, okay? So if you're dealing with, let's say, uh, 116 gigabits per second, which I believe was the value that was quoted in uh, the question, then the baud rate would just be 58 gigabaud. Okay, so I've cleared off a little space so I can explain why we care so much about all of this. So let's draw out our graph here that shows the first resonance and then going on to the second resonance. So this is our F1 value. And if this is 109 gigahertz, then this is gonna limit what bandwidth of signal we can support. Now let's suppose that we're trying to transmit a signal through this via and we wanna reconstruct it at the other end of the interconnect. Well, our useful bandwidth is gonna essentially be all the way over to here at the minus three dB point. 
What frequency is this? Well, it depends on the Q value of this resonance. So if you actually take an insertion loss measurement, you'd be able to see where the 3 dB point is for this particular spectrum, given a 109 gigahertz uh, F1 value. This could be you know, 70, it could be 80, it really depends. Let's suppose that we just care about receiving the data and then reconstructing a bit stream, not necessarily getting a perfect measurement of the shape of the digital signal. So for that, we worry about the Nyquist rate. And a good, you know, conservative rule of thumb is that this should be, F1 should be at least five times F Nyquist. So I'll just NYQ for Nyquist. So essentially if I take this and I divide it by five, that gives me a Nyquist frequency, F NYQ, of about 22 gigahertz. So if this is PAM4 signaling format, that would give me about 88 gigabits per second. So my 10 mil stub could conceivably support 88 gigabits per second without serious signal integrity problems due to the reflections and losses that would normally occur at a via stub. So that's one way we can interpret this. Now let's compare these two. We can already see that if we compare them, we basically have a 2.5 factor difference, right? Because here these two frequencies are different by a factor of two and a half. It's because the lengths are different by a factor two and a half. We could only support basically 88 gigabits per second divided by 2.5, assuming we're also dealing with PAM4 signals. Okay, so I got my phone here. If I take my 88 uh, gigabits per second divided by 2.5, I would basically get a data rate of 35.2 gigabits per second. Again, this is assuming PAM4. Also here, we're assuming PAM4 signaling. This should really illustrate the effect of the VIA, right? If we leave a longer VIA stub, we can only support smaller data rates. That's because the bandwidth is smaller and we need more bandwidth in the channel in order to support these higher data rate signals. So this is pretty simple. And if we go all the way up to, let's say, a 40 mil VIA, so now we're really decreasing the value of the, uh, the data rate that we could support. We would basically be taking this, dividing it by four, we could only support 40, uh, 22 gigabits per second on PAM4 signaling. And if we were then going to non-return to zero signaling, then we would even be supporting even lower data rates. So keep that in mind. This is essentially the way you would use these frequencies is you eventually want to get back to a data rate because we care about all this stuff for digital signals. For analog signals, it's a little bit different. I think the takeaway here is this. If you're not dealing with these really huge data rates and really uh, broad bandwidths, you don't need to worry about removing all of the, uh, the stubs on your vias. So sometimes if you read high speed design guidelines, they tell you, oh, always back drill the stubs, remove the stubs from the vias. For one, it's not really practical, but for two, you usually don't need it. All right, everybody, thanks again. And before you start selecting which stubs you need to back drill, don't forget to call your fabricator. Yeah.